Okay, where are we? The subject tonight is the subject of priests and preachers entering Islam. And uh, often people ask me, we heard about you were, used to be a priest or something, and you came into Islam, so, you know, tell us about it. We want to know, how does that happen? And it's not just Muslims who want to know. Non-Muslims would like to know the story too, because they feel like, you mean you didn't understand? I mean, you were a priest, you didn't understand about Jesus? Come on, man! So, it's a topic that I talk about a lot. The first thing I have to do is clarify a couple of points. I was not a priest. In the English, we use the word priest to mean somebody who is in the Catholic Church. If you're not from the Catholics, if you're from the Protestants, then you don't use that term. We usually use the term, for instance, pastor, minister, preacher, reverend, and these are some of the titles. We came up with an awful lot of them because that's the way humans are, right? Give ourselves titles. So I was a preacher and a minister of music. But it doesn't really matter, but just if you're talking to a Christian and you say a priest, he's going to say, oh my God, how is that? And when they find out, oh, you weren't a Catholic, well, that's a lie then, you weren't a priest. So I want to clarify that. As a matter of fact, I will tell you in my own estimation, I'm probably the least, the least of the factions within this equation. Because there were so many other people that came into Islam the same time I did. That's why it takes a little bit of time to tell the story. But they asked me to tell it tonight, so I'm going to do that. But I want you to listen carefully to realize what goes through the mind of a person that's not Muslim. Okay? And I usually start out by telling people that my father and I were both ministers and both of us were also businessmen in the reverse order. We were business first and preacher second. Got me? Because, well, you know, as they say, business is business. And that's exactly how it worked. We operated mostly in Texas. We had a place in San Antonio, Houston, and also in the Dallas area. And we were very concerned about Christian conditions. So my father started something called Concerned Christian Centers. And basically, if you look at it from a material point of view, it was a place to sell stuff. But what we would do is take consignment things in. People could bring things into us, and then we would sell it and keep part of the money. And keep a lot of the money. But anyway, they would bring in what they make with their hands, arts and crafts. And a lot of old women, they like to sit around and make things, then they give it to us. And this helps the church, which is called the church, and then it helps them as well. So it became like business and religion tied together, and that's very common in our country. At one point, my father told me, we're going to start doing business with a man from Egypt. Well, I said, well, oh, this is great. International sounds good. We can put this in our business card. We're international. He said, and this man is from Cairo, Egypt, and that's where, if you know, they have the Nile River, they have those big pyramids, they have the Sphinx, Abu Hul, you know, they got everything. And we said, oh, this is good. He said, and he's a Muslim. I'll never forget it. I've told the story many times, but it's just like it happened yesterday. I'm standing in between the kitchen, or in the dining room and the living room area, you know, like this when we're talking, and I just stop like this. I said, what? A Muslim? No way. No way do I want anything to do with that. They, Dad, come on, you should know better than anybody. Because we were linked in with other preachers. My father supported people like Pat Robertson. Huh? You know him? Huh? Pat Robertson? <laughs> and Oral Roberts. He's not very popular anymore, but he used to be real strong. And his ministry up in Tucson, uh, uh, up in uh, Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. In addition to that, people like uh, Benny Hind. I don't know if you heard of Benny Hind. He's coming over this way. So look out. And there's <laughs> many of them, many of them. John Hagee and uh, the list goes on. Jerry Falwell, Jimmy Swaggart. Some of the names, maybe you heard those before. We know these people. We know all about them. All about them. Okay? So at one point, here I am standing there talking to my father about a Muslim. 
These are the enemies of God. This is what we've been taught. These same people, I just mentioned their names, in their preaching on the television and so on, this is what they teach. Muslims are no good. Now it just became Muslims are terrorists. But back then, you know, we, we didn't reach that level yet. We were still just kidnappers, hijackers, you know. They said that Muslims don't believe in God, that they're worshiping a black box in the desert and they kiss the ground five times a day. Now that's what we know, man. So here's this Muslim going to do business with us. I told my dad, no way, I'm not going to do it. And he insisted. He said, I, I want you to meet this man. He's very nice. And I said, I don't want to meet him. I, was, I never am like this, by the way. But on this case, I said, no, that's one thing I'm going to stand firm against. We're not going to do it. He said, I want you just to meet him. I said, all right, I'll do it for you. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go to church. And it's going to be on Sunday. When I come out of the church, I'm going to have my Bible under my arm. I'm going to have the salib. I used to carry a big cross. I'm going to have my cross with me. And I'm going to have my hat that says, Jesus is Lord. And I'm going to have my wife, born again Christian, with me. And we are going to get this demon, devil, infidel, Muslim. And we're going to show him Jesus. Okay? And this is a true story, by the way. So I got up that morning on Sunday and I was thinking, ah, oh, man, you know. We went to church. Strangely enough, the preacher was preaching out of the Old Testament about salvation coming at the time of David, which, which really puzzled me because according to Christianity, it's coming through Jesus. And it really, that opened a door for me, but that comes up later in the story. Why was he saying there's salvation before Jesus? That's interesting. Now, when I get there to my father's store, I'm looking around, you know, I'm looking for somebody wearing, you know, a long white robe and some kind of black, you know, thing over that, with a long beard, and hmm, I guess I was looking for me, what I? <laughs> Anyhow, when I get in there, I don't see this guy. By the way, imama, sword, everything. I, I told Khomeini, maybe. This is what I had pictured. I said, where is he? I'm ready. My father said, he's over here. I said, where? He said, here. He was a normal guy. He was normal. He didn't, you know, didn't have a beard. He didn't have any hair at all. I said, how do you do? He told him my name. He introduced himself. His name is Muhammad. I said, how do you do? After the niceties of, hello, how are you? How's everything? I said, uh, do you believe in God? He said, yes. Oh, yeah? Hmm, sure. He said, but do you believe in the God of Moses? He said, yeah. Abraham? Yeah. Hmm. What about David and Suleiman? He said, yeah. So when I meet this man, I'm impressed that he's believing these things, but I thought maybe he's just saying it. So I even asked him, what about Jesus? Because I thought maybe they're... Kind of, first, I thought Muslims were like Hindus. That was first. And then when he said he believed in some of the things of the Bible, I said, okay, maybe they're like Jews. So that's when I said, yes, but what about Jesus? Do you believe in Jesus? And he said, yes. I said, okay, okay, wait a minute. This is going to be easy. I can convert this guy. So I agreed that we're going to do business with him. And in fact, I took him immediately out to have tea together. We sit together, drink tea, talk a little while. And I started trying to preach him right away. I'm in the Bible. I got it right there. Flip it open. Genesis. Let's talk about Abraham. What do you know about Abraham? Abraham, he had two sons, you see. And blah, 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 blah. And I'm doing all the preaching to him. Hmm? Imagine this. And he sit there. Hmm. Okay. He's a graduate of Allah's heart. And he's, mm -hmm. Like this. Get me? You know what I'm saying? Well, it happened that during Ramadan, some of his friends that he was staying with had to move their apartment around or something, and he was going to go stay in the masjid for itikaf in Ramadan. It's normal. 
We didn't understand. I thought he has nowhere to go. And I told my dad, this man has nowhere to go. And my dad said, no, he's got money. I said, no, no, he doesn't. Daddy, I'm telling you, he has no place to go. I heard him say he's going to go live in the mosque to a Christian. If you're going to live in the church, ooh, that's the worst. So I said, let me, let me offer that he can stay at our place. And my dad said, no, you, you, don't do that. That's not right. I said, no, I'm going to offer it to him. I went to him and I said, how would you like to come stay at our place? He said, no, 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 I want to go and stay there. I want to stay in the mosque. and It's something good. I said, oh, man, look at this poor man. Oh, my God. He doesn't know, you know. I, he just, oh, poor soul. Please come and stay in our house. And he said, no, I can't. I, I need to go stay with her. I said, look, at, I'm scratching his dignity. So I told him, listen, no, 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 no. I want you to come and you can pay. You can pay money and stay with us. He said, how much? I said, $15 a week. Which in America is like nothing. $15 is nothing. I said, and then he kind of hesitated. I said, and we'll pay for all the food. Well, you eat $15 worth of food in one day in America. He said, okay, all right. And I told my dad later, I said, see how I did that? Because now he'll stay with us. He knows he's getting a good deal on the food. And I was making it all about money. Well, I didn't know he wanted to come and stay with us. He wanted to learn about how are Americans and how is the Dawa going to be. What do we believe? Especially people who are preaching. So he came and stayed in our house. And I said, well, now that's good. I'll travel with him and go with him in places and he'll see and he'll learn about Christianity. As we were traveling and working together, we put up tables just like this and booths and things and set things out for people to come and look at them and sell things. And I caught him one time. He, when somebody wanted to take something from the front, he took it from the back and gave it to him. And I looked at him. And the next time somebody started to take something, he took from the back and gave it to him. I said, hey, Muhammad, we take the stuff from the front because that's the old stuff. The new stuff in the back, just hold it back. You know what I'm saying? This is dated material. Get rid of the junk first. He said, no, I can't. In my religion, we can't sell something unless we give the people the best. I said, mm, got me on that one. And I'm supposed to be telling him about a better deal. I said, okay, okay, yeah, whatever. You're never going to make any money, though. But that's all right. Over a period of time, I came to learn a lot of things. Also about being humble. A lot. Because this man was obviously well-educated, very articulate. He could really talk about a lot of subjects. In fact, I tried to debate with him about many things. But he was so wise and well-educated that he could see what I was doing. And he would take it easy and let me win every debate. I could win any debate with him if, if, if he wanted me to. But if he wanted me to lose, I was going to lose. It was, this was how well he could handle it. Now, what happened, one of the preachers that I knew, another preacher, who used to carry a big cross and walk down the street so people would stop and talk to him about religion, he had a heart attack, and he went to the hospital. So I went to the hospital to visit him, and when I was visiting him, I met another man in the hospital who was in a wheelchair. This gentleman had a problem. He didn't want to talk to anybody. And I told him, let, let me witness to you. Let me share the message of Jesus with you. So I took out my Bible, and again, I start telling him about a prophet, Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam. And I'm telling them, look at Jonah. He's in the belly of the whale. He's in the sea. He's down there like this, and who knows how long. And suffering like this, you don't have as big a problem as that. And God saved him, so he could save you too. He said, hmm, didn't want to talk to me. I asked him, what's your name? He didn't want to tell me. Where are you from? He said, I'm from Venus. He said, what's that? Well, we do have, there is a Venus, Texas, by the way. But he said, you know, he's from another planet. So I kept, each time I would go, I would talk to him, witness to him. Finally, one day, he started crying. I was pushing his wheelchair around. I took him down. I rolled him around different places. He started crying one day. He said, I'm going to confess something to you. I need to confess something to you. Now, to a Catholic, confession means you're going to tell the priest all your sins. 
and then he's going to forgive you. Well, I wasn't Catholic. And I told him, listen, I'm not Catholic, and I'm not a priest. I'm a preacher. He said, I know better than you do. I am a priest. I said, oh, my God. This man is a priest, and he knows the Bible better than I do. He said, I just have had a hard time. I've been here and having heart attacks, and I've been having problems and everything, and trying to figure out a lot of things. He said, I'm sorry I took it out on you. I really am. I apologize. And he started crying. And when he started crying, I felt sorry. You know, I hugged him, and I said, it's okay. One day I went to the hospital, and my friend was gone. So I started visiting with the priest. And it happened one time I went to visit him at the hospital, and he was gone. And I asked him, where did he go? They said he went home. I said, home? He's a missionary priest from South America. How did he go home? She said, I don't know. He's not here. I'm sure his family. I said, he has no family. I know him personally. He has no family. Where did he go? She said, I don't know. We're not responsible for them. I said, well, let me see where he went. You got it in your file? She said, I can't do that. Those are locked up. Nobody can look in the file. And I got in the lady's face and I said, listen to me. This man could die in the street right now, and it's going to be your fault. And you're going to get sued because I'm going to sue you for him. She said, okay, his folder's over there, but I'm not going to watch. And I went over and I looked for it, got address where he went. Sure enough, he was in a place where they put people that have no place to go, a shelter. So I went to the shelter and I found him. He was still on crutches. He saw me, he started crying again. He said, please get me out of here, get me out of here. I said, okay. Come live at my house. Now, I told you the story so you can see something. Now look, I have two visitors in my house. Huh? One is a Catholic priest. The other is a Muslim. And I'm thinking I can get the Catholic priest and convert him to be a Protestant. At the same time, I'm going to catch the Muslim and bring him over to Christianity. Uh, high aspirations. But it didn't work. Some strange things began to happen. We would sit around the table at night to discuss what is the Bible and what's the salvation. My father has a Bible. It's called King James Version of the Bible. Most of you probably heard about it, especially any students of Abhmedidat or Zachary Nike who've heard about King James Version of the Bible. But I work out of a different one that I've had since 1953. It's called the Revised Standard Version. And it says in it, King James Version has grave mistakes, grave errors, defects in it. That's what it says. So I begin to preach out of mine, which doesn't match. Now my father said, no, it's this way. I said, no, it's this way. Now my wife comes up with her Bible from Jimmy Swaggart. It's called The Good News for Modern Man. Okay? Totally different. It's written in modern vernacular. You can just, you know, say anything you want to with it. You don't even recognize the Bible anymore. The Catholic priest, he's got another Bible, an older Bible with 73 books. We're working out of 66 books. And his is not even the same in the verses. It doesn't match up at all. And I never even knew about this subject until then. And he's saying this, and I'm saying that. My father's saying something else. My wife's on something else. And all the time, Muhammad the Muslim is sitting over there like this. So we asked him, I guess it was me asking him, I said, well, how many versions of your book, your Koran, do you have? He said, the Quran has no versions. There's only one. It's original. It's in the Arabic language. This is the book that has no doubt. It's guidance for those who have taqwa for Allah. As Sheikh Muhammad Jabali was just telling you about this shield or taqwa that you have to have between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And only certain people are going to get the Huda, Hidayah, Ehdina, from this Qur'an. These people that have the taqwa. So when he's telling us that the Qur'an is one, I'm going, huh? And it's in the original language, we still have it. You know what I was thinking? He's lying. I was sure he was lying because he could see the problem we were having and he just sat back and made that up. But I don't know Arabic at that stage, so I don't know what to say. You know, maybe, I don't know. 
And he left it at that. He didn't try to preach. But it put a big doubt in my mind now about we got all these books. He's got one. And La Rebefi, no doubt in it. Mm. So another time we had another discussion that came up. Now this time I went to the other preacher who had the cross. And I was asking him, I want to be able to explain the Trinity. He said, you know the Trinity. I said, yeah, I know, I know, I know. And I know the Council of Nicaea when we had that. But I want to know the way to explain it so a human being can just understand it. He said, okay. It's like an apple. Just take an apple. The apple has a shell around the outside, the, the skin. Inside is the meat. Inside of that is the seeds. Okay? Three things, one apple. That's the way. I start going back. I'm going to tell this Muslim about the Trinity. But on the way, I remember his arguing with me, his way of debating with me. I said, no, he's going to tear me apart. As soon as I say seeds, he's going to say there's more than one. So it could be seven or eight or nine or ten gods all rolled into one. No, no, no. It's got to be special. It doesn't work like that. Let me go back and try again. So I went back to him. I said, what if he says there's more than one seed in there? He said, okay. I said, and besides, it could have a worm running through it. Then that would make it go up another notch. What can I do about that? He said, okay, okay. Forget the apple. I said, okay. It's like the babe, the egg. Use the egg. The egg has a shell. Inside of the egg is the white. Inside of the white is the yellow. Three, one egg. That's it. Said, that, that's good to go. Now I start going home again, and it hit me. Wait a minute. The egg could have a double yolk. God becomes four, just like that. Plus, it could be rotten. I'm not going to ask him again. So at the market one day, I saw a man, and I was talking to him, because I was listening to some things that Muhammad had told us about the belief in Islam, Allah is one. And so I was telling this guy, you know, i got some doubts about the Trinity. He said, you a preacher, you have doubts? I said, yeah, I, 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 it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. How could three be one? He said, okay, okay, look. You see me? I'm one man. I said, yeah. I said, my wife? Yeah. It's one person. Yeah. I said, my son? Yeah. Three. One. One family. It's the family of God. Use that. I said, there you go. The family of God. You don't get very far on that one and you realize right away they could have another kid just like that. But worse, they could get a divorce. You want a God that can get a divorce? Huh? In Texas, if you get a divorce, your wife gets the car, cars, house, your retirement check, your 501, your Keo plan. She's going to get your computer and even your email. You got nothing left. And I don't want a God that can have a worm in it. I don't want a God that can be rotten, and I don't want a God that can get a divorce. I want to explain this Trinity the right way. Sure enough, the subject came up, Trinity. There we are. Now here's the priest trying to talk about the Trinity is like an apple. I'm going, you don't go there. And then he's an egg. Don't worry about it. The family of God, forget about it. I know what's going to happen. So we ask Muhammad, we say, okay, what do you say about God? What do you think he said? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هو الله أحد الله الصمد لم يلد ولم يلد ولم يكله كفوا أحد. And he explained it something like this: Say he is Allah, the unique, not like anything else. He's eternally sought after by his whole creation, but but he doesn't need the creation. He's not the father of anything. He's not the son of anything. He's not like anything. And he is unique. I had. I said, boy, that's exactly what I already think, but I can't admit that. That sounds too easy. Uh. But plus in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to tell the Christians, don't say three. Here's a little point. I'm going to go out of the story for a minute to show you something. Nowhere in the Old Testament, the Torah, or the Zabur, the Psalms, or the Injil, which is the New Testament, nowhere in the Bible do you find the word Trinity. Not once. Not once is the word Trinity. But it's in the Quran. We have it in the Quran. It says, 
Salat. Tell them not to say Trinity. Oh. But they don't have it, and Allah said, don't say it. Guess what else? The word Bible is not in the Bible. Bible is from Greek. It means biblios or book. Book. But it's in the Quran many times. Is it? Kitab. Book. Ahl kitab. People of the book. So we found in the Bible a shortage. They're talking about it, but the Quran is explaining it. I found actually in the Quran I can explain the Bible much better because it gives me the things I didn't know how to explain. So then in my mind, look what I did. I started realizing what he was saying was true, but I never admitted it. Instead, I was taking this and mixing it. And when I would go give my next talk, I would say so and so and so, and I would use what I learned from the Quran to explain what's in the Bible. Some of the people liked it, but some of them didn't. Because when I began to talk about salvation being based on what? And the Bible tells you in there, there's no Savior except God. It says it real clear. Jesus is not your Savior. God is. <gasps> when I found that, I said, okay, let me try another way to explain that. Each thing as I would learn it, I'm trying to change how I'm presenting the thing. It still doesn't dawn on me, I need to do something. But I could see for sure God is only one, and that, so I totally forget the Trinity thing. My dad never did believe it anyway, so he had no problem with it. Now we come to some new thing. The priest asks the Muslim, can I go to your church with you, the mosque? He said, sure, come on. Well, he went, and they came back. So he took the priest aside, come here, come here. What do they do? What do they do in there? Well, tell us, what do they do? Do they, like, kill some animals, or what do they do in there? He said, no, they just stand there like this, and they pray, and they leave. I said, what? They pray and leave? He said, yeah. Uh, okay, what kind of music do they have? He said, they didn't have any music. No music? How in the world are you going to worship God without music, man? So I asked him, Muhammad, you guys don't have any music? He said, no. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I'm in the piano and organ business. I said, how many mosques are there in the world? He said, millions and millions and millions of them. And I said, none of them have a piano. He said, no. Any of them have an organ? He said, no. Oh, man, I can get rich. Just introduce some music to these guys, put it in there, you know, bound to be. I said, do the Arabs have any music? He said, oh, Arabs have music. I said, hmm, boy, I got it figured out, boy. <laughs> I can see my next million dollars coming right straight up to at me, you know. So then the priest asked again another time, he want to go back to the masjid again. He went, this is the middle of July, 1991. He went to the masjid with him again. And by the way, this masjid, Sheikh Muhammad Jabali knows it very well, is on Medina Drive in Arlington, Texas. And that's where they were going to, because we were living in Midlothian, just south of Oak Cliff and south of Dallas. So they didn't come back. All night we're waiting. What happened? Very late they came back. And when he came in, I looked. There's Muhammad. I recognize him. Who's the guy with him, though? He's wearing a white jalabia, white dress like this. He has a white pillbox cap on his head. And I looked at him and I said, Pete, his name was Father Peter Jacobs, but we're not, you know, Catholic, so I don't have to call him Father. I said, Pete, did you become a Muslim? He said, Ashhadu wa la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad Rasulullah. I said, Oh my God! Now I used to have cameras like these cameras right here because we had a television show called Estes Music Jamboree. So I got one of our cameras out, opened it up, set it all up on the tripod, and I was going to interview him. And ask him, well, you know, well, you went to Islam, what happened? While I was talking to him, though, he fell asleep. So it was still in my mind, and I was thinking, what am I going to do? This is too amazing. Now, here I'm preaching to the people, and I'm trying to change what I'm saying. And here's a priest, just became a Muslim. My father's saying it's a good deal. It sounds all right to him. I don't know what to do. So I decided, I'll talk, make mashura. Huh? I talked to my wife. 
We have an apartment upstairs. We were in our apartment up there, and I'm telling her, oh, you know, a priest became a Muslim today. What is that? And can you imagine what they were saying about the Quran and saying about this and so and so? All of a sudden, she said, I want to get a divorce. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not the subject, but uh, what happened? She said, no, all this talking about religion and talking about Islam and so I can see it. I said, oh, no, 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 no. No problem here. No, no problem. I said, you thought I, no, no, I was just observing somebody else. No, I'm not interested. Trust me. I don't want to be with those Muslims. Last thing I want to do is be with a Muslim. Ah, no way. <laughs> just put your mind at ease. She said, I need a divorce. I said, what are we going with this again? What's the problem with that? What happened? She said, a Muslim can't be married to a Christian. I said, what? No, wait a minute. Hold on. I don't look. Look at me. I'm telling you. I swear, I don't want to be a Muslim. Okay? Okay? And even if I did, don't you remember what he said? A Muslim man could be married to a Christian woman. It's not a problem. But I'm not saying I want to. I'm just saying it's not a problem. She said, that is the problem. A Muslim woman can't be married to a Christian man. I want to be a Muslim, so I need a divorce. I'll never forget, I was sitting right on the edge of the bed, just sitting there, you know, and I almost fell over. I said, at last, I can tell the truth. I can say it. I didn't realize that she liked the idea. I was afraid. I said, okay, the good news is... I, too, want to be a Muslim. You know what she said? I don't believe you. I said, no, no, really. I was just saying that because, you know, but for sure, just so you know, I want to be a Muslim. I've been thinking about it. I want to be a Muslim. We're both going to be Muslim. Alhamdulillah, it's going to be great. Right? You know what she said? I don't believe you because you're either lying right now or you were lying five minutes ago when you said you didn't want to be a Muslim. And either way... I don't want to be married to a liar. So get out. So I started leaving. I'm walking down the stairs of the apartment. I'm down to my father's part. I said, wait a minute. Where am I going to go? This is my father's house. I just got thrown off of my own property. <laughs> what happened here? So I went to get to Mohammed and I woke him up. I said, come, you and me, we got to talk. Come with me. And we went outside the house and we walked those country roads in Middle Othian, Texas until the time for the, dawn, uh, the sun to come up at dawn. And all that time I talked to him about what's it like to be a Muslim, how do you have to believe, what do you have to do. Let me hear all of it now and no more playing a game. I'm not debating, I just want to know. Just tell me. Just tell me what's Islam. I need to know what I need to do. And he told me everything and I realized this is it. I've got to make a decision. This is a big deal, though. And he told me, okay, this is up to you. You have to go make a choice for yourself. I can't help you. I said, oh, my God. So when he was praying Fajr, I decided, I've been watching this man praying this direction with his head on the ground. It's so beautiful to see a man humble himself, put his head on the ground to the Rabbil Alameen. I said, oh, my God. Let me try that. So I sneaked off somewhere where nobody could see me. Illallah. And then I found a place, a board there, you know, and I bowed down on the ground and I put my head down on the ground on that board there. And I was, and by the way, I'm pretty good at speaking, especially in prayers. I used to make so long a prayer, they wouldn't let me say the prayer at Thanksgiving because the food would be cold. Okay? So, but I put my head on the ground and only these words came, no more words, just this. Oh God, guide me. That's it. And I was thinking, well, I've got to say more than that. Nothing. Oh, God, if you're there, guide me. That's it. After a while, I sat up and I looked around. There wasn't any fancy rainbow. It wasn't birds flying around. There was no big signs from above. There was no music, angels, harps, nothing like this. It was just a cloudy day in Texas. But inside, I could realize I had to make some changes. To me, that's what I need to do. There's the problem, it's inside of me. 
Within a few minutes, it became clear what I needed to do, and I had to develop an idea of how to pull this off. I talked to my wife, I talked to my father, I made a bath, and at 10 o'clock that morning, in Middle Othian, Texas, I went in front of this man named Muhammad and this new man named Yahya, who used to be the priest, and I said, Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Immediately after that, my wife did her shahada. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. A few months later, my father did his shahada. Ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. Step by step by step, we saw so many people enter into Islam. We wanted to tell the whole world what is Islam. We wanted everybody to know the real Islam. I said, how could this escape our knowledge? How could we not know about this great and wonderful thing called Islam? And it looks like all we got to do is just tell the people. I went to the imam of the masjid there and I told him, let's, let's tell the people. Then I found out something else about us as Muslims. And that's why we've got this convention here right now. This is why we have the exhibition. So you're going to use this week to learn how you can become, inshallah, the best Muslim you can be and how you can show the real Islam to the people that are not Muslim. This is your duty. This is your duty. This is your language. This is your people. Just as it's my duty to give the message to my people and my language. And so uh, the same way, it's your duty to give the message to your people. Allah will not ask you if they made shahada, but he will ask you if you delivered the message. Alhamdulillah today, I can tell you with no doubt in my mind, we have seen thousands of people give shahada, several hundred at a time. And I don't do it through debates. But I don't need to debate any Christian. I was a Christian. I am a Muslim. If you want, I can give you both sides. Easy. Okay? I'll play both parts. I'll be the Christian and tell you this, and then I'll be the Muslim and give the answer. And there won't be any argument. And I've done that so many times. And let me share one story with you before I end. I'm going to leave now. Inshallah. I was telling the brothers today that I was asked to give a talk in a church in Hagerstown, Virginia, uh, Hagerstown, Maryland, just outside of Virginia. This was in 1999, and I went there and I gave a talk in the church on Sunday, because I know how to address the people. How many years was I a Christian? 50 years? I know what they want to hear. You get them ready, and they said, oh, wow, this is normal preaching. But then when I came to the part, la ilaha illallah, I stayed on la ilaha illallah until they said, yes, that makes sense, that makes sense. There was one old lady that she was saying yes. Afterwards she said, yes, but I just don't want to do it the way you're telling me. Okay? But guess what else happened? Two people did shahada right there. Hello? In the church. In front of their preacher. They said, yes, we agree. We like this. We want to know more. And we say there's only one God to worship. Shadu la ilaha illallah. In front of the preacher. And one of them was his daughter, I took them to the masjid and they did shahada in the masjid that afternoon, a Sunday afternoon. And later, the boy, he married the girl. they are Muslims living there now. Now, let me ask you a question. If I would debate and argue with this preacher and made him look stupid, would he ever bring me back again? No. I'm going to ask you a question. If you were at a place and you saw somebody change their religion to another religion in the temple of that religion, and the father was the priest there, what would you think? Is that man ever going to call me again? Do you think he'd call me again? Three months later, he called me again. Come back again. We really enjoyed it so much. I said, how's your daughter doing? I want to remind him, see what he's going to say. He said, well, she's doing fine. She likes Islam. It's very nice and lovely. She treats us so good. You know, we're amazed at her personality. We love you guys. Could you please come back again? And I did, alhamdulillah. So I'm just showing you that it's not guidance from me, not guidance from you. It's guidance from Allah. Allah guides whom He wills, whom He wills. So we ask Allah to guide me, all of us, and all the people.
And whoever he guides, they'll be fine. But whoever Allah doesn't guide, <laughs> they got a problem, serious problem. Our job here with this exhibition of peace, the vision of Islam, is to do one thing, communicate the true message. If the people don't want it, that's your choice. That's their choice. We don't have to take it. But it's our responsibility in putting this on, all the scholars that are here, it's their responsibility to tell us what's the truth in Islam and let us see for ourselves. And that's what we're going to try to do through this week. So I need you guys to listen to me. You have to participate. Your side of it. Your side of it is to show up every day. And your side of it is to bring other people. I want you to look at all that blue plastic. Look at the blue plastic back there. You see that blue plastic? The next time we come up here, I don't want to see blue plastic. And that means I don't want you to steal the chairs tonight, okay? I want you to go get some people and fill up those chairs so they can hear this message before it's too late. Because if that man from Cairo, Egypt, had not taken the time to spend three months of working slowly, carefully, nurturing myself, my wife, my father, my daughters. They also became Muslim, by the way. I forgot to mention that part. And a priest. Look at what Allah gave him. And from all the people that we gave Shahada, this man in Egypt is taking the reward for that, even now. Even now. I'm not saying you'll give a Yusuf Estes the Shahada, but I'm saying Allah will give you the reward according to what you're trying to do. Please don't leave this place tonight and forget what you heard here. Please carry this with you. Dr. Jaffer Shaker Dries and Muhammad.